I'd like to welcome everyone to this meeting of the Planning Advisory Committee and briefly go over some procedural rules for the meeting. Uh, the meeting is held in a hybrid format in accordance with the electronic participation policy for virtual meetings. Full corporate policy 050 regarding electronic virtual meetings is available online to review. Staff and presenters are reminded to keep their video and microphones off until requested by the chair or members of the committee. All cameras for virtual task force members shall remain on to ensure quorum. Members who are present in person will be given opportunity to speak first, followed by virtual participants. All members will vote by a physical show of hands. Please leave your hand raised until the chair has determined the result of the vote. In the event a connection service interruption occurs that affects quorum, we may recess the meeting for up to 15 minutes to regain quorum. If quorum is not achieved, the meeting will be adjourned. Item one, roll call. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Yes, so I have uh, Ken. Um, Greg has provided regrets. Kirby Brown here. Uh, Velma has sent her regrets. Uh, is Rick here? Uh, Ed has sent his regrets. Mohammed. Uh, Dennis Dalloway, I see, is here. Uh, Barb Smith is here. Mark Simpson is here in the room. Uh, Christine Clark, Christine, uh, Paul Basanti, who I see, and uh, Councilor Atley, who is also here in the room. Thank you. Item two uh, Members of the committee, do any of you have declaration of conflicts of pecuniary interest to make on any of the items before the committee? Item three, there's one presentation on the agenda for today, section 15, 6.3, presentations of the city's procedural bylaw allots the presenter 10 minutes and further, section 15.6 indicates that members would need to wait until the debate of the item to ask questions or of the presenter and staff. As the presentation today encompasses a lot of material with no objection, I would suggest we waive those two rules to allow for greater discussion with the consultant. Any objections? Please play, raise your hand. Okay. 3.1. Paul Lowe's at SGL Planning and Design Incorporated. Uh, review item new zoning bylaw project, discussion papers and summary report, financial impact, none. Uh, I would now ask Paul Lowe's from SLG Planning and Design to come forward to provide a presentation on item 4.1. Do so on a bylaw project, discussion papers, and summary report with an introduction from staff. We want to thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Victoria Coates, and I'm a senior planner and long range planning at the city of Brantford. Um, I'm also joined by other staff uh, who are working on this project. We have Alan Waterfield, who's the manager of long range planning, Joe Mugo, who's the manager of development planning, and then on, on Zoom, we have Casey Congratz, the senior planner and development planning, and uh, Nicole Wilmot, the director of planning and development. We're also joined by uh, Paul Lowe of SGL Planning Design, who is the city consultant for the new zoning bylaw project. So this project is focused on establishing a new zoning bylaw for Brantford um, that will replace the city's existing bylaw that was adopted over 30 years ago, um, and will also replace the county of Grant zoning bylaw that currently applies to the boundary adjustment plans that were annexed to the city in 2017. So the new zoning bylaw will implement the city's new official plan that was recently adopted in August of 2021, and will also address provincial policies and other emerging best practices. So today we are presenting our first uh, deliverable in the project, which is a series of background discussion papers and a summary report. And we'll be seeking comments from the committee for inclusion and staff support uh, to the committee as a whole on July 12th. So now I will uh, turn it over to Paul for his presentation. Thanks, Victoria. A pleasure to be before you today, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, so I'm going to walk you through um, the bylaw, the, well, the discussion papers, I should say, on the bylaw, a little bit of an upfront uh, in the, the beginning. Then we're going to break it into three sections. So I'm going to cover off uh, a third of it, 
uh, and then break and see if you have any questions and then and, and go forward the second part and the third part if that, if that works for you. So when we start off, uh, it works. Okay. So uh, I, I know many members of the committee probably are fully aware of what the zoning bylaw does, but maybe uh, I'm not sure if there's any members of the public listening in. Just very briefly, uh, zoning bylaws intended to implement the official plan. We, we've uh, got the official plan approved last year. It's timely to uh, now uh, do the zoning bylaw, making sure it implements. And it really goes down on a finer level of detail in terms of permitted uses and, uh, and what you can do on a property uh, than the official plan. Uh, it gets into aspects of, of course, height and size of buildings, uh, yards, setbacks, parking, landscaping, and a number of other matters, which we'll all go through. But that's just a really high level overview uh, of the uh, what a bylaw does. Sorry. <laughs> it can be ambidextrous here. So uh, we've got a six phase process um, uh, that we're working through. The first phase was uh, just data collection uh, on a number of studies that are related to the uh, zoning bylaw. Of course, the official plan, which uh, our team was, uh, uh, SGL and the planning partnership were, uh, were the authors of. Uh, and the second phase was preparing a public consultation and communication plan, which was undertaken by the planning partnership. Which will guide us through the uh, through the process, and you see that the next uh, four phases each have public consultation involved with them. Uh, we had uh, we had a virtual public consultation uh, PIC last week, and we've got an in-person one uh, tonight. Uh, and so uh, the phase three was, was the largest component of the process so far, fairly extensive, dealing with a number of background uh, papers. Uh, those. Yeah. Uh, to this one. It's yeah. like it's like an extended picture. Sorry. Oh, okay. So where do I? So I, just want to get I know it's not oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um. So. So, um, the ten discussion papers that uh, we prepared, um, and we uh, we uh, we've got a summary paper as well that summarizes provide something a little bit easier to read is uh, fairly extensive with all these, but these discussion papers look at existing zoning bylaw as well as Brant County zoning bylaw because Brant County is, uh, um, there's a portion that's part now of the city. So that zoning bylaw applies to the expansion areas, uh, as well as um, uh, we looked at the best practice for each of these and looked at what the official plan re uh, requires in terms of each of these matters. So it's not for the run and yeah, the I'm just, it's not, it doesn't seem to be working the same as one in the other room. So we'll do resume and then just there. Sorry. That's okay. Can, can everyone see the presentation on, uh, virtually? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. So I'm going to walk through each of this, each of the 10 um, uh, discussion papers. So I'll and I apologize for those on the screen. You'll, uh, you'll, you'll see me looking at on my right. I'm going to have to look at the screen on the wall. Um, so the first one was the zoning bylaw structure paper. Uh, and in the zoning bylaw structure paper, what we did was look at what's the appropriate structure of a zoning bylaw. And you, you might not be aware, but there's a number of different ways that we can structure a zoning bylaw. Uh, and other municipalities do have a uh, slightly different structure. Um, so, some, it's a lot of the older zoning bylaws, like Brant uh, and, Br and Brantford, are more of the traditional um, the structure of a zoning bylaw, which is based on you know, largely the size of the lots, and you have different sizes of residential lots. You have a different zone, different types of commercial have a different zone. So it's you get a lot of zones um, uh, because of that. There's there's a number of other uh, other ways to look at it, and what we're recommending is to align the zoning bylaw closely with the official plan. And what I mean by that is that. When you have official plan designation, such as low density residential, we'll have one or maybe a couple of zones under low density residential. When we have the intensification corridors, we're going to have a zone for intensification corridors. For uh, employment, prestige employment, general employment, those are designations of official plan. We'll have separate uh, zones for those. So, so we'll, we'll get into that as I go through each of those, uh, those sections. Uh, some other recommendations. Uh, we have are to set out a user guide uh, for the zoning bylaw. 
the user guide is, is for the public um, when they open it up. You know, it's a daunting document and could be confusing to the, the average public, but never opening a zoning bylaw. So it provides a couple of pages to walk the public through how to use the zoning bylaw. If they want to find out what zone applies to the property, what they can do on their property, and what the parking standards is, it walks them through so they understand that. We also looked at ways to make it a little bit more uh, you know, user friendly for the public. So we look, we're looking at uh, making it visually appealing with, with, uh, with both the maps and figures and tables that aid in readability uh, and potentially using colored figures. The, the example on the right hand of the screen is St. Catharines and they do it an interesting way. Each of their zones is a different color. And then when they have the table of permitted uses, those same colors find out in the, in the table. So you'll see in the table, you'll see the first column is C1, light pink, and you'll see in the map, there's a couple of those real light pinks in, the, in C1. So it's an interesting way to, to, to make it easy to understand for the public. So that's really what we're gonna be focusing on as we write the bylaw is uh, trying to make it a little bit uh, uh, more readability and easier for the public to understand. Uh, the second uh, uh, discussion paper was general provisions. So general provisions are those zoning provisions that apply right across the municipality, uh, across all different zones. Uh, so we uh, did a thorough review um, and uh, with, along with staff who provide us a number of comments just from their experience with the bylaw on those general provisions that need to be revised or maybe not, not needed anymore. Uh, we recommended some of the general provisions to be moved to the, the actual zone sections because some didn't apply across all zones or really focused on certain zones, such as open storage, really applies only in the industrial area. So uh, we would recommend to move those over to those specific zones. There's a number of provisions also that are, are no longer current in our usage, uh, amusement arcades, uh, long gone from my childhood and we don't see them much anymore. Uh, satellite dishes, um, uh, they're much smaller now and we can deal with them as accessory structures. Uh, and uh, we also re recommend a number, looking at our best practices from other municipalities, we looked at a number. There's, a, there's other general provisions that we think might be useful uh, as we work on a bylaw uh, in Brantford. Uh, setbacks, uh, pipelines, restaurant patios, community gardens, a number of others, these are just a few examples. So we'll be looking at that as we prepare the bylaw and which one of those uh, would, uh, would fit in Brantford. The next uh, uh, report was uh, definitions report. This is the largest report because we went through each and every definition uh, in the bylaw, as well as the, uh, the Brant County bylaw because those definitions apply. There's a lot of similarities uh, uh, and some differences. Uh, we identified, we identify them in various colored categories here. So the ones in, in green are to be carried forward. Um, the ones in, in yellow are to be carried forward with some edits. And we also, when we say carry forward, sometimes we recommend carrying forward the Brant County's uh, bylaw definition rather than the Brantford uh, definition. Uh, we also identified uh, ones in orange uh, are definitions that we may need uh, when we write the bylaw, but we might not, it, largely because they're related to certain uses and whether we're gonna need that use in the bylaw or not will determine when the, the bylaw is written. And the ones in red, uh, we're recommending we likely don't need uh, in, the, in the bylaw, uh, maybe because the, the, term, the, the term is already um, addressed by another definition or uh, we're just not gonna have that use. One of the biggest examples is retail stores. Um, there can be a number of ways to define retail store, a jewelry store, a, a watch store, a clothing store. Well, it's all retail and we're looking at just defining retail store. So we can get rid of some definitions and that's just one example. The next uh, discussion paper was uh, parking and loading uh, standards. Uh, so we uh, looked at the parking rates for both Brantford and Brant County and compared to the best practices a number of other municipalities. We looked, tried to look at uh, municipalities uh, that are similar size to Brantford, but also most importantly, have newer, more modern zoning bylaws, uh, just so we can get a, a, an idea of, of what they, how, how they differ from, from Brantford. Uh, there's a number of uh, uh, areas we're recommending changing. Uh, the, Retail rates 
Uh, we're recommending to be consistent across all different types of retail uh, and also uh, changing it. I think the current rate is one space per 25 square meters. We're recommending it, sorry, one space per 30 square meters for some of the retail. We're recommending they all go to one space per 25, which is a little bit more restrictive, meaning you need more parking the lower that second number becomes. Uh, and it's because when we look at many of the other municipalities, they have a, that's a similar rate. Uh, Frankfurt's is a little uh, uh, less than, than most other municipalities. Uh, you'll see that we talk about arenas here in assembly halls. Uh, right now, they're based on uh, capacity for either per seat uh, uh, or probably capacity, rated capacity of the arena. Those are hard to enforce uh, and hard to determine whether it's, 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 it's meeting that requirement. Uh, and so we're going to more of a standard of, of per square meter. So it's, so it's easy for the bylaw people to, to look at it and understand the parking requirements when they come in for building permit and any changes, they'll be able to uh, monitor more, more closely. Uh, we're looking at changing apartments um, to, we're proposing to change it from 1.5 spaces per unit to one space per unit plus 0.25 for visitors. Now, um, when we uh, presented to the uh, Zoning Bala Task Force, uh, they recommended that we uh, do some more research on that in terms of the existing apartments in Brantford to see what the usage rate is for the, for the existing parking spaces. So looking at, uh, staff are looking at doing that over the course of the summer. Uh, we're also looking at a similar rate of fourplexes, double duplex stacked townhouses, all which have apartments would have a similar rate for apartments. All industrial type uses, we're recommending they require one space per 100, which is a consistent rate for, for industrial uses. And different industrial uses right now have different, different requirements. We're going to look at a consistent requirement for that. And then lastly, we're looking at for single detached dwellings, uh, semi-detached dwellings, to uh, require uh, two spaces, uh, and they can be in the front yard or a garage. I'm just going to pull up this little diagram. Currently, the requirement is one space. Um, and your required space cannot be in your front yard. So, uh, sorry, in the front yard setback. So the front yard setback of a six meters, if you have a 12 meter long driveway, you could, you could park it in your driveway, your required spot. Otherwise the required spot would have to be in a garage or in the side yard, um, but that's your required spot. It doesn't mean you can't park a car in your front yard. It just doesn't count to your required. We're gonna make it a little more simpler for the public, required two spaces. And it could be in the front yard, required front yard, could be in the garage, could be two in the correct front yard. You just have to have two spaces. And that's what most other municipalities require for singles and semi-attached dwellings. Uh, other um, uh, changes we're looking at um, for parking standards are looking at aligning the parking exemptions with parking exemptions in the downtown. We want to align that with the boundaries of the downtown precincts, which are set out in the official plan. We're looking at uh, considering shared parking for mixed use zones. A number of other municipalities are not doing that when they have mixed use. And, and what that looks at is, is what is the, looks at different times of the day and looks at what the, uh, what's the highest use in each portion of the day. And that would determine your maximum amount of parking. So for instance, an office would need 100% of their parking during the day, probably 10% in the evening, whereas a residential with a visitor parking would need more in the evening. Uh, retail stores would need more in the afternoon. So you, you look at all these different requirements by each period of the day and figure out what's the most uh, requirement during that period of day. And that's that's the you know the highest number is what uh, would be required to provide. It seems to work in others. So we're gonna look at whether that uh, can be applied here for after. A uh, couple other just minor uh, changes like parking stall widths uh, would be expand when you're adjacent to a column or a wall. Uh, we're also considering offsite parking, uh, permitting offsite parking for small infill or intensification, smaller ones. When sites just not big enough, uh, can we look at um, allowing them to uh, rent space from agreement somewhere within a certain distance? Um, it, it is uh, permitted for industrial type uses and commercial uses, but can we do that also for, for small scale input? Something we want to throw on the table on that. Um, uh, some other minor changes is parking aisle widths. We want to simplify in the bylaw. Uh, we want to use accessible parking standards similar to Brant County, which is, which is a, lot, uh, 
a lot simpler to uh, understand. Uh, we want to consider adding uh, bicycle parking provisions uh, for apartment buildings and mixed use buildings. Uh, I'll look at considering electric vehicle parking charge requirements uh, and uh, also looking at simplifying the loading space requirements, which is, which is really complicated in the, and it have two different si sizes of loading requirements and it, and it depends on the size of the size of the building. Um, some other municipalities have a little more simpler uh, requirements. Uh, so a uh, fair amount of uh, kind of administrative changes in that. Area. So that, Mr. Chairman, that this is the first section. Uh, and, uh, I stopped talking for a while. Maybe others have some questions. We can. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, so let's talk and discuss the first uh, first item um, regarding the new zoning bylaw project. Uh, any questions from uh, the members of the committee? Paul? Paul? Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, congratulate the uh, city, all their staff on this initiative. I, I appreciate how significant a, a task this is. Uh, very, uh, very good presentation. Uh, most of my technical questions are, are answered, but I have a, a more holistic question. Uh, understanding that the official plan uh, that was approved came out uh, before the Housing Affordability Task Force report that was done by the province's uh, task force uh, last year, uh, are there any considerations being made by uh, the consultant, its uh, zoning task force, or, or any city staff for incorporating some of the measures that were, uh, that were advocated for in that Housing Task Force report? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman. So we, um, well, let staff talk about whether there's anything else for the pitch plan, but in terms of the zoning, when we're looking at the, uh, like called existing neighborhoods, um, and we'll see when we get down to the residential, we are looking to be a little bit more um, uh, flexible uh, in terms of uh, the amount of units permitted. Uh, and in the newer areas, even more flexible. And I'll get into that when we talk about the residential sections. Mm -hmm. We're also looking to try and reduce the num number of residential uh, zones to allow some gentle infill in our existing neighborhoods. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, I'm Waterfield Manager of Long Range Planning. Uh, just to build on what uh, Paul was just saying, um, yeah, the, the new official plan was a lot more flexible in terms of the type and range of and, and mix of different housing types that are going to be permitted throughout the neighborhood. So the new zoning bylaw will be implementing that. So I think we were already moving in that direction in terms of a lot of the um, recommendations that were in um, the task force report. Um, and, and certainly as we move forward, um, We'll have an opportunity to go back and make any amendments to the official plan if we feel they're necessary to to align with you know some new information or something that we want to implement through the through the zoning bylaw to make sure that uh, both of the documents work together. So we'll we'll always have to have a constant eye on what's coming out of the province. We certainly had to with the official plan project with the changes to the growth plan. So. We'll, uh, we'll just roll with it like we did for that and we'll work through the zone. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Nicole Wilmot, Director of uh, Planning and Development Services. Just to build on your question, uh, Paul, um, a big a big uh, component and assumption of the housing affordability report was really dealing with the assumption that increasing development at this speed at which, uh, you know, planning approvals are, are uh, you know, considered by municipal councils will uh, also assist in, in providing, you know, an increase in housing affordability. And so a big part of what we've been working on in addition to the zoning bylaw is, is looking to streamline 
streamline our development approvals process. Um, and so uh, we are actually um, later, uh, early actually next week, we will be presenting to the Building and Construction Task Force with a series of process improvements to improve our site plan and our site alteration and our, and our permitting process. So all of these things are happening in a push to streamline development approvals and, and hopefully assist with, with the housing affordability component of things. So that's in addition to the zoning bylaw work that we're already doing. Thanks. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I do have a comment. If I may, this yeah. is one part of a broad scope of, of uh, initiatives that planning departments have uh, are taking to streamline the, the planning process. And, and uh, you know, it's a lot of moving parts to through the planning process. And I, I just want to staff uh, you know, really driving this forward with a little bit of help sometimes it's true uh, it's something i feel very passionate about and i know that businesses will um, very much um appreciate i think what the final models you know like in a, in a year or so it's probably well on the way to to achieving a lot of, a lot of um, significant Improvements to, to our process. And of course, you know, we hire uh, great guys like Paul. We pay our fortune too, but he, but he delivers on, on the goods for sure. So that's fine. That's great. Thanks, Councilor. Any other questions, comments? All right, could I uh, please, if there are no, no further questions, can I please get a mover and seconder on the following motion? Oh, so we'll Oh, 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 sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. We have two more parts. That's right. I thought we had split. It's a, it's a big recipe. Okay. <laughs> yes, it is. That's right, Ken. I've seen this one so already. So. Um, Perfect. So the next uh, discussion paper, number five, uh, is on our mixed use zones. Uh, so the mixed use zones, as I indicated, we're going to, this is getting into the actual zone provisions uh, and the zones. We're going to try and uh, reflect the official plan. So the official plan has uh, mixed use designations uh, and the, the downtown urban growth center is, is one designation and it's broken up by a number of precincts. Uh, so it has the main street precinct, the lower, down pre, lower downtown precinct and the upper downtown precinct. So we're proposing three different zones to match those precincts. Uh, we have the historic Main Street zone that we're, we're recommending, and that would be in the, the core of the historic downtown. Uh, we're also looking at providing an overlay, which is a, another zoning technique which we could we could use, uh, because there's certain, uh, there's a fish plan requirement that not to permit accurate residential uses on certain streets in that precinct, but not the entirety of the precinct. So. We're recommending an overlay in that area to uh, restrict those back grade residential uses. The lower downtown uh, is where a majority of the intensification is, is anticipated through the official plan. So we'll be reflecting that with a different zone that allows for higher heights than eight stories to reflect that, uh, that permission for more intensification. Then we'll have a upper downtown zone uh, which includes a crown amount of existing low rise residential neighborhoods. And this is one situation though, it's gonna be designated uh, that for downtown, we're recommending those existing low rise residential areas be zoned in a low rise residential zone rather than upper downtown. The upper downtown would focus there more on the commercial street uh, uh, uses and along the uh, arterial collector roads. Uh, and uh, again, would have a height overlay to regulate Heights because in the Fisher Plan, there's different heights uh, uh, permitted along the arterial roads and collector roads and near the downtown transit terminal. So we'd have a height overlay for that. The next zone would be the major commercial uh, center zone. And so the major commercial center uh, is, is a designation of the Fisher Plan. That's where uh, I think there's four of them, if I recall, without the maps in front of me. Uh, including uh, including the major uh, major malls and, and uh, other uh, major uh, clusters of, of commercial, uh, and so we'd uh, zone that a major commercial, recognizing the permitted commercial uses, but it's intended to be a mixed use zone. 
So future apartments, uh, other intensification could occur in, in that zone. Uh, the next is, uh, is we're getting in the intensification corridors. And so we're looking at uh, the majority, except for one, all being designated as intensification corridor zone, except one difference is the Brant Avenue uh, intensification corridor, which is also subject to a heritage conservation district. So it's a bit different than the other intensification uh, corridors. So we're recommending a separate zone for the Brant Avenue uh, heritage conservation district. Uh, with different provisions for mixed use and standalone residential because standalone residential is permitted under that HCD Heritage Conservation District. Uh, then in the re remainder of the intensification corridors, we would be permitting uh, resident would be permitting full range of mixed uses. Uh, institutional use is another uh, area that we think we should pull those out and just put them in the institutional zone, which I'm going to cover, discuss in a, in a, in a bit. Uh, so they wouldn't be in the intensification quarter just because there's, you know, they're not intended to be intensified, uh, but remain as institutional use. Uh, and then the residential and industrial zones that are currently located in one of those corridors, we propose to free zone those to the new intensification corridor with the permitted heights and, and, uh, and, um, and uses. So in terms of the previous question of what are we doing in terms of the um, the, the housing task force, this, this is another issue the housing task force recommended was the pre-zone areas so that uh, applicants don't have to go through the zoning process if they meet the intent of the official plan uh, for the permitted uses and, and heights and density. So uh, by pre-zoning all those corridors, they're ready to, ready to go uh, applicants. So we just have to come in for a site plan approval, which should, should quicken the, the approval process for those uh, landowners. Uh, the next discussion paper is the residential zones. And these two discussion papers are, are, are they really the meat that are going to be a, of the new zoning law that covers most of the municipality. Uh, so we're, we're uh, proposing to consolidate 13 existing residential zones down to six new zones uh, based on the official plan designation. So the first would be a suburban residential zone. And, and that really applies to the, the really large lot residential areas, the, uh, the uh, unserviced residential areas. Uh, there's a few in the existing boundary of the municipality. The rest are uh, in the former county, Tudela Heights, uh, and, uh, and a couple of other uh, uh, lands up on Powerline Road. So we'll be combining what is currently zoned residential estate rural residential and suburban residential into this one new suburban residential zone, uh, which we permit uh, just basically uh, detached dwellings, but also some accessory uses, uh, accessory uh, uh, additional residential units and home occupations. The reason why we can't look at a broader range of uses is because these are all uh, basically private service lots, uh, not municipal service lots. Then we get into the, into the low rise residential zone. So we're, pro we're proposing three different low rise residential zones, which matches uh, closely what the official plan calls for. So as I said, we'd, we'd look at combining all those existing uh, low rise residential zones, the existing community into one, it would be for the, uh, the existing uh, neighborhood zone, which would put single semi-attached duplex and additional dwelling units. Then in the greenfield areas, these are the new areas uh, you'd have, uh, the, the areas in uh, Grant County north of uh, uh, Powerline Road, the new areas around, uh, around Tudela Heights, uh, uh, along the Conklin area that's just uh, being finally developed, would be zoned the greenfield uh, zone, which would, which would allow for a bit of broader range of uses, including multiple unit dwellings, townhouses uh, in that form. Uh, and we'd have, we'd, what we'd do is set out different provisions for each housing type. So if you're going to build a set single, this is the, the front yard, side yard, rear yard. If you're building a townhouse, this is your yard provision. So a lot more flexibility uh, uh, and uh, permits a lot broader range of uses. Then in the, in the official plan, in the, the new greenfield area, uh, uh, there's also what's, what's designated as a neighborhood corridor. Um, and so this is intended to be a little bit higher uh, level of density, uh, permitting low rise apartments, townhouses, stacked down houses. So we'd have a separate zone for that area. There's a couple areas in the existing, uh, um, a couple of the medium, medium density areas is next. 
Uh, but I think in uh, uh, the Compton area, there would be a similar uh, neighborhood border zone applied. And then we'd look at a, a mid-rise zone, and this really combines your two existing medium density zones into one, uh, which would permit all types of uh, multiple units mid-rise up to six stories, um, except in your existing R4A and R4B zone sites, the existing zone is only at the four story. So we'd keep that in those zones, uh, but all new areas would be a zone for up to six stories. Uh, then the last residential zone would be the high-rise residential zone, which would uh, bring forward the uh, your existing residential high density zone and permit a broad range of apartments, group homes, uh, and non -residential ground, with non-residential ground floor on it, with residential uses on the ground floor. Uh, so permit it, not require it, but permit those non-residential uses on the ground floor. So when we look at the neighborhoods, and, and you'll say, why are the commercial zones under the residential zones discussion paper? Because we looked at the residential neighborhoods that are designated in the official plan, and it encompasses your smaller scale commercial areas are in that residential designation. So we looked at those and identified that it recommend three different zones. Uh, we're recommending an automobile service gas station zone. It's largely your existing uh, C6 and some C8 sites, zone sites, uh, and, and zone those separately. And then we would uh, have a separate zone for a convenience commercial zone, which is a really, really small uh, commercial site you find in the, in the residential neighborhoods. Uh, and then a separate zone for the neighborhood commercial zone, which are the, low, uh, the bigger sites, but they're plazas. We have a grocery store, drug store on that plaza site. And those we'd be looking at, uh, they could be intensified in the future with residential uses as well. So they're still gonna be, uh, 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 somewhat of a mixed use zone, uh, permitting, permitting both. And that finishes the second quarter, Mr. Chairman. Second quarter, All right. second, third of it. Any questions, comments? Um, my question uh, to you, Mr. Chair, is, is this the appropriate point where we talk about the specifics of the report that we were given? or just general comments on the presentation? Because it's actually the report we're gonna receive um, and make comments on as part of, as the planning advisory committee, correct? Through the chair at this time, you would just be providing, uh, if you yeah. have any questions for the consultant about the portion of the presentation we've just seen, but then we will move on to the- uh... No question at this time. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, do you have your hand up? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I did actually need to put it in the previous section, but uh, the shared parking in mixed use zones is uh, an excellent recommendation and uh, one that would find the, the Chamber of Commerce's full support. I think that's uh, a really forward looking policy. And uh, I, I think a lot of municipalities that enact that can leverage their underground infrastructure really well. On a, on a density per hectare basis. So just wanted to uh, acknowledge and appreciate that. Mr. Chair, it, it, from a, this, uh, this particular section um, generated a lot of discussion with uh, the council. And I think it was, there was more discussion around parking than, than any of the others. So it's, uh, it is important and, and your comments are very welcome, Paul. The others? Sure, carry on, please. Yeah. Sure. So just finish up the last, uh, last number of uh, papers. I think we have four left and uh, fairly, should go fairly quickly. Um, so the next one is the employment zones uh, paper, uh, and it, of course, looks at the employment zones and, and like, again, reflecting the official plan. The official plan has two employment designations, general employment, prestige employment. So we're going to reflect that with similar zones. Uh, the uh, general employment zone modeled largely after your existing M2 zone uh, and permits the broadest range of, of uses, including uh, you know, a more uh, traditional uh, uses, uh, 
more heavy industrial uses, outdoor storage, all that would be permitted in the general employment zone. Uh, there's one, uh, as Alan said, sometimes when we're doing these zoning bylaws, we realize an issue with the official plan and we need to make an amendment to the official plan. Uh, we realize the official plan uh, permitted used automobile dealerships, but not new automobile dealerships. So we're gonna, that was just a, uh, an overlook on, on our part. So we're gonna take that out of the Fisher plan as the same, so it, uh, we have consistency. The following from the Fisher plan, offices are capped at 50% uh, of, of the gross floor area. And in the prestige employment zone, um, so these are the, the more, um, we call prestige lighter industrial um, zones. They don't have outdoor storage. Uh, similar to the picture there uh, on, on the screen uh, along the highway, and, and much, most of the prestige employment zones are along the highway. Uh, be modeled after the existing M1 and M3 zones. Again, we have an office cap at, at 4,000 square meters, uh, 40,000 40, square feet, which flows from the official plan. There's a number of other, um, when you look at the official plan and for these general employment designations and pre prestige employment designations, we find other zones in there. We find agricultural zone, not surprising because all the lands north of Power Lane Road uh, and over on our garden are, are new expansion areas and already uh, zoned or currently zoned agriculture. We, we uh, recommend free zoning those to the employment. So it gets the employment lands already zoned and ready for, uh, for industries to come in um, uh, to get to start, uh, start developing. Uh, there's also rural residential again in those areas that we'd recommend free zoning to employment. We have two other um, uh, zones that fall in that designation, a neighbor commercial center. And I think it has, if I recall in the report, uh, it has similar industrial type uses. So it would be free zone. And then we strangely have a, an existing residential high density right beside the, uh, near the downtown, uh, beside the, uh, the shunting yard for the railway. Uh, should not be a high density, it's vacant uh, and should not be a high density zone site. So we're recommending to uh, rezone that to employment. Uh, so that's the employment uh, discussion paper, uh, the brief. The next one is the institutional zones. Uh, the official plan has a major institutional zone uh, and we're recom uh, recommending to have a major institutional designation. This is for the larger uh, sites uh, uh, that fall into that designation and zone. The other in institutional uses, the smaller ones, elementary schools, places of worship, um, libraries, are all captured in the residential designation, but we're recommending they be pulled out in a separate minor institutional zone. Uh, and, and that would encompass then the I, I1 zone, the uh, I2 school zone, the N1 zone, uh, which I believe is the, the county zone by law. Uh, and we put that on a minor institutional zone for the smaller sites. And then we'd have different lot and yard provisions. So a school would have, if it's a school site, would have different provisions from a place of worship, from a library, when it would be catered to each one of those different types of institutional uses. The next zone is the agricultural zone. Of course, we don't currently have an agricultural zone in the Brantford zoning bylaw, but we do in the Brant County zoning bylaw. Uh, and we still have uh, agricultural areas designated in the, in the official plan. Um, currently, there are two agricultural uh, zones, an A zone and an AE zone. We're recommending going forward just one agricultural zone. Uh, and there's actually only two AE zone sites in the boundary of the city of Brantford, and they're both site specific. So we're gonna carry for those two site specifics under the new agricultural zone. Uh, and we're going to have separate uh, provisions for whether it's a farm or whether it's a rural residential uh, dwelling, um, not on a farm, or whether it's a, a farm production at a greenhouse. But we'll different zone provisions for each of those different types of uses. Lastly, uh, our last discussion paper was the other zones, which we collapsed everything else into, into one discussion paper. Uh, the, the majority of this is um, the core natural areas and, and parks and open space. So in the official plan, we have a core natural zone, a core natural areas designation. We're proposing to follow that through with a core natural areas zone. Uh, 
and where we would zone all the land zoned agriculture. Really, this is because in the county, a lot of the woodlot stream corridors are just zoned uh, agriculture. We'll zone those a core natural zone to re reflect those natural features. Uh, there's in the official plan, there's a, a number of modified policy areas. The modified policy area is basically a, a special policy uh, because what's What's ex existing or previously permitted didn't follow what is actually permitted under the broader policy. So, in the core natural areas designation, we have a number of modified policy areas that allow either existing residential uses, there's a spot that allows some existing industries. So, we'll carry forward those as site specific uh, provisions in the new zoning bylaw. And then there's a couple of existing areas that are either zoned commercial or zoned residential that contain natural features. And we'd split the, those sites and the natural components of those sites would be zoned for a natural zone and the, the non-natural would be continue their commercial or residential zoning. Uh, in terms of open space, again, we're recommending one new open space zone to uh, implement parks and open space designation. There's a number of existing institutional uses that are located in that designation. Um, so we identified a number of options to do with them because they're not actually permitted right now in the official plan, uh, but they're existing institutional uses. So we're recommending either to amend the official plan to permit the uses, uh, redesignate to an institutional designation or apply a modified policy area to those uh, sites. And so that's something we're gonna have to look at more in the, in the next uh, stage of our report. Uh, and uh, and a couple of other um, final zoning recommendations when we looked at some of the final zones, there is a, a development constraint zone that's along the river, uh, largely uh, dealing with erosion issues. We're going to put that in a core natural zone with a site specific. There is an existing highway commercial C5 zone and an M4 zone that aren't used right now, so we'll be deleting those. Uh, we're going to create a, a site specific zone, either open space or core natural zone to apply to archaeological sites. There's a number of really sensitive archaeological sites that have been identified. No development is supposed to occur on them. Um, we don't want to flag them in the zoning bylaw. We don't want people to actually know about these. So we will zone them open space and just a site specific that simply says no buildings are permitted. Uh, we're looking at to create an intake protection uh, overlay zone um, to regulate um, under the source water protection, there's uh, for your intakes, for your for your drinking water, there are some restrictions on uses that can go in there that could impact on drinking water. So we'll apply that overlay zone into that area. And then lastly, uh, flood zone overlay. That's what you have an existing overlay in your zoning bylaw for flood zones, and we'd care for that flood zone overlay. So that finishes it. To, oh, and just one last. I forgot the one last zone. One little area uh, 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 over on Shellard that has a, a planned unit development zone and really is just a hold almost a holding zone. Uh, and the last little area is applied to a large area, and those larger areas have been rezoned. The last little areas, and I think these are all mostly owned properties, uh, we're going to rezone it to reflect the uh, what the official plan designates. So this is a this is the PUD overlaid on the official plan. So we have institutional, we have parks and open space, we have the core environment, core natural areas, and we have one little square that's residential and we rezone those to those uh, to those uses. Uh, before I go to comments, I'm, Mr. Chairman, I might as well just finish up the next steps so if I could, and then we can turn it over to questions. So um, as I said, we're at six, uh, six phase study. Uh, we uh, have um, public information, last public information center tonight. Um, we have a presentation of the committee of the whole on July 12th, and then we get into our next phase, which is the strategic directions. And the strategic directions are really um, setting out, I call it the recipe uh, for the new zoning bylaw. Uh, we're going to set out what the structure is and kind of set out the table of contents and what's generally going to go in, in each section and what the, the zones will look like and the, and the permitted uses and provide an overview of that. So I think that with that, no, Mr. Chairman, that's our presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, comments, questions for that section? Okay. 
Yeah. That was a good show, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. That's a lot of work. <laughs> so. uh, can I please get a mover and a seconder for the following motion? A, that report 2022-402 uh, titled New Zoning Bylaw Project Discussion Papers and Summary Report be received. And B, that all comments from the Planning Advisory Committee be included in staff's future report to the Committee of the Whole, Planning and Administration. That is part of the discussion. Uh, members are encouraged to provide their comments, which can be incorporated in the motion for the vote. I do that. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, can you please confirm uh, for the committee the motion, including comments that the committee will vote on? Would anybody like to submit formal comments? Now that we're in the I do have a, um, a couple of questions specific to the SGL report that was contained as part of the part of this. Um, I think they're more just little potentially edit things that are missing. Um, for instance, in the uh, page 47 of the report under suburban residential, it talks about um, also a, a lot frontage of 24 meters is recommended. Is that a minimum, a maximum, or that's the only value? So it, that's unclear to me in, in that part of the report. Um, there's another reference um, in the current institutional zones around, in particular, the county branch zoning bylaw and one minor institutional, but later on in the report, uh, about nine or five lines later, it talks about an N2 zone. I think that's likely a typo, but not positive. Um, so just some minor things like that. Um, should those be brought up directly here or can they be addressed directly to um, city planning staff um, just for tidy up? Um, through the chair, I think those are, are pretty technical um, yeah. edits. And if you want to maybe email staff and we can provide that, that clarification. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I would think you'd be open to all, absolutely. Any any comments or, or anything to on the way. So, okay. Okay. Do we have any? Anyone else have anything to add to this? Um, so basically taking kind of what Mark said and maybe just generalizing it, that consideration be provided for uh, minor technical revisions uh, throughout the reports. Is that, to the chair, does that sound like that's everyone's okay with that? I think so. Any, any problem with that? So yes. Okay, so all those in favor of that comment being uh, provided to staff as well as receiving the report, please raise your hand if you're in favor. Dennis, Kirby, Barr, Paul, Paul, do you have your hand up? Are you in favor? Or? I don't think I'm a liaison position. I don't think I'm a voting member of this committee. Oh, okay. You're, you're appointed. Uh, you do vote. It's, uh, it's okay. the BIA that doesn't vote. So do that. Yeah, I, I support it. Okay, uh, and then Ken, Mark, and Councilor Rutley, so that's carried. Okay. 4.2, amendment to the City of Brantford Zoning Bylaw 160-90, respecting the bylaw for seasonal outdoor patios and to rescind the temporary use bylaw for recreational vehicles. Uh, citywide, the financial impact is none. Uh, second item we're considering is in regards to the amendment to the city of Brantford zoning bylaw. Uh, oh, sorry. Regarding those, uh, those two things. Um, and presenting. Oh, sorry, I just make sure. Yeah, yeah. the same thing. So um, I understand staff will have a short presentation and introduce the item. 
uh, to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself and uh, present to the members. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Joe Mito. I'm the manager of development planning in the city. I mean, um, before you before you here today, uh, staff's bringing forward a zoning bylaw amendment to extend assistance to local businesses by allowing them to establish outdoor patios in order to provide for continued recovery from the economic impacts of the pandemic and provide for more area, provide more area for dining and patrons. Staff also recommends that the temporary use bylaw for patios and recreational vehicles be repealed as outlined in the report before you. Next slide, please. Yep. Great. Specifically, this will be achieved through a bylaw that eases parking restrictions on private property associated with these patios subject to regulations discussed in the report before you. The report also recommends that temporary use bylaws be repealed for recreational vehicles. Next slide, please. By way of background, on June 16, 2020, City Council passed a resolution to allow the establishment or expansion of private patios uh, and on-street patios. This was uh, when restaurants first began to reopen following the first wave of the pandemic. As the pandemic continued, City Council had further directed planning staff to prepare a report regarding a temporary use bylaw respecting the parking requirements associated with outdoor patios, which was passed on March 23rd, 2021. That bylaw allowed for a three month grace period once the declaration of emergency was terminated. In light of the termination, the report before you recommends that similar regulations be established permanently for patios. Next slide, please. The temporary use bylaws for the use of RVs were approved by council on January 26, 2021. Council's decision also included wording that allowed for a grace period beyond the termination of the declaration of emergency. In this regard, the report also requests that the temporary use bylaws for both patios and RVs be repealed. Next slide, please. As was the case through the temporary use bylaw, this proposed bylaw will state that notwithstanding table 6.1, which is the parking table, a patio shall not contribute to the required parking calculations for a restaurant or other business and may occupy a space that would otherwise be required for parking subject to the additional provisions provided on the next two slides. For example, if a restaurant wishes to establish an outdoor patio on three required parking spaces because there is no room elsewhere on site, they would not be required to establish these spaces elsewhere. Further, the additional tables on the patio would not count towards occupancy for the purposes of the parking calculation. The reason for this is to provide businesses with the opportunity for continued economic recovery as well as to enhance the community by providing added character, vibrancy, and sense of place. Next slide, please. The next couple of slides are the proposed provisions in the bylaw that would keep patios from obstructing required works, maintaining accessible parking spaces or areas, permitting unamplified entertainment, ensuring that patios are adjacent to the business and establish a setback from residential uses. Next slide, please. The proposed regulations will also include a seasonal time frame for their use. And lastly, the regulations would allow further conditions to be imposed if deemed both reasonable and appropriate to safeguard uh, public safety or mitigate nuisance. Next slide, please. Similar, once again, similar to the temporary use bylaw, this zoning bylaw will work in conjunction with the existing patio Brantford policies. These policies further regulate the establishment or, or extension of these patios as outlined in the report. No on-street for, for committee's information, uh, no on-street patios were established over the last two years. The report before you will also recommend that the, the patio Brantford policies be made permanent. Next slide, please. So in the way of consultation, planning staff did provide notice of this application in a variety of forms. Uh, planning staff consulted with the chamber. Uh, there was a statutory notice in the civic news of the uh, committee of the whole meeting, which was held on Tuesday evening of this week. Uh, emails to both uh, RV licensees as well as 
previous patio owners uh, were, was provided as well as mail out or Canada Post to both the uh, RV licensees as well as the owners that had applied for a patio over the last two years. Staff also worked with communications uh, staff and various uh, city departments. City departments did provide some feedback and comment as well as there was some comment through the various social media platforms that uh, that outlined what staff was proposing with, res with respect to the permanent patios. And then obviously before you today to mm -hmm. seek out some direction prior to, uh, pri prior to council's uh, decision-making at the end of the month, uh, which is, uh, which is um, I believe the 26th, yeah, 26th of June. Uh, comments were received from the chamber, which outlined it, which are outlined and discussed in the report before you. Uh, various departments did uh, provide some feedback, which is also in the report before you. One comment was actually received from, from the social media platform, I believe it was Facebook, from a member of the public that was supportive of having entertainment on these patios. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, planning staff, uh, for the reasons outlined in the report, are recommending to, to committee and council uh, that uh, the zoning bylaw and the extension of the patio Brantford policies be uh, be approved, and that the temporary use bylaws for the RVs, as well as the previous patio regulations, be repealed. Next slide. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, that that uh, wraps up my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Joe. Any questions for anyone for Joe? Mark? Um, I've got uh, <clears throat> questions, one in each of the two areas, one on the patio and one on the RV. I'll start with the RV one because I think it's the easiest. Sure. Um, so I agree that removing the RV uh, piece is worthwhile. Um, what if, and this is really a question of staff more than anything else, but what if, um, the situation occurs where potentially this type of isolation might be required in the future. Um, would the city be able to consider it in the future? Uh, in the future, um, and how quickly? Yes. If I may, yes. Yes. Just a man who would just bring an amendment for it. So I'd be pretty simple. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. yeah. Through, through the chair, if I could add to to Mark as well. Um, uh, Councilor Ali is correct, but we would pivot again if you know there's the unfortunate need to do so. Um, but as you heard today through uh, SGL, that we are working on a comprehensive zoning bylaw, and the idea is to ensure that these types of things are reflected in that bylaw, so we don't have to continuously pivot in this type of fashion. Similarly, uh, you know, planning staff presented to this committee in the past about emergency shelters. Um, so that made its way into the new, and it's going to make its way into the new bylaw. It's in the existing bylaw. So that's something that we will look at uh, on a go forward basis. Uh, my second question is in regard to the patios. Um, I, uh, my comment is, I think it's really good that we're, the city's willing to continue this. I think it does bring some vibrancy to um, any of the businesses that want to use this. My concern really though is for some of the established businesses that were established before the temporary bylaw was put in place, but went through the process and actually used the, the patio calculation of seating to increase their number of parking spaces. Is there any provision, uh, and I realize it's kind of retroactive more than anything else, but it does seem to potentially penalize a few businesses that may have made business decisions um, around building or not building a patio in the past, which potentially unfairly advantages, disadvantages them compared to somebody new. Uh, that's my only comment on that. And I think it's great that the, the plan is to not uh, change the parking and the forced parking rules. Are, that's a, a great thing, just to keep that yeah, thing uh, status quo. So, Councilor, if, if I may, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, um, the, those those businesses, uh, a lot of uh, outside councils and uh, social kitchen and so on, 
they already had uh, patios in place. So um, what some of them have been able to do is sophisticate those uh, those patios a lot more with, with a structure for a shade and, and um, just to make it more European. Uh, maybe it's a, a better way of saying it. And, uh, you know, I, I think Canadians, you know, were cooped up in the winter for, for uh, five, six months or so. And we love the outdoors when we get the opportunity. And I think the, these, the expansion of patios in places and businesses that didn't have them, uh, didn't have the space, didn't have a, a number of different things. You know, they're encroaching onto the sidewalks, and it really adds to the atmosphere. You know, you go to uh, Montreal, Quebec City, some European cities, uh, especially Italy. Um, you know, there's, um, I'm sorry, Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> Italy too. <laughs> Italy too. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, uh, it, it, it's just a beautiful lifestyle. And uh, so I think we're, you know, we're, uh, we're getting there. And I think this, really gives an opportunity for businesses to make up for the huge losses that they suffered over the past couple of years. Thank you. Councilor, anybody else? Comments, questions? Okay. There are a couple of hands up. Oh, okay. oh there's the call. <laughs> Hi, thank you for that. I just wanted to provide a bit of uh, just a little bit further on the uh, repealing of the temporary uh, use bylaw for the RVs, just with respect to the need to, to have to bring that bylaw back as a result of, of the current pandemic or, or you know, unfortunately, a, a new pandemic. Um, I did just want to add, though, to that is that we do uh, receive, uh, you know, weekly case counts with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic through our emergency management coordinator. We did have a discussion with them about the appropriate time to to repeal this bylaw and and quite frankly we we also did um you know some uh windshield type surveys of, of properties that did register to use the rv as an emergency shelter um and and found that they weren't being used at that time but uh what we did degree, uh, decide or agree at that at that level was that we would continue to keep our finger on the pulse just watching those as an as a corporation we are watching those those COVID 19 numbers and if there is a, a need to bring that bylaw back we've through that committee, we will, you know, keep our finger on the pulse. And at that time, we would then be able to pivot rather quickly. And most likely, we would just bring the same uh, bylaw back before council and emergency management for consideration. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just want to, for the benefit of the committee, vocalize that the Chamber of State come out enthusiastically in full support of the patio bylaw. We think that's a great measure to help a, a sector that had very unpredictable uh, circumstances thrust upon them have more predictability in operating in the future. So uh, full enthusiastic support, and there should be a letter accompanying uh, the report to the Committee of the Whole, which is, uh, that's already passed, but, um, yeah, just for them. Any other comments, questions? If I could add maybe one comment, and sure. this maybe goes back to Paul, if there's any way in terms of the chamber, uh, you know, bringing some further communications about even these on-street patios, because we've got the policies, no one's taken us up on them, and we would love to work with one of these businesses to have one of these uh, activated on the street by that character, as Councillor Utley has mentioned. Uh, Mr. Chair, if, if I might uh, respond to that, uh, I'd be happy to sort of bring something to our membership. Uh, if city staff has any sort of, um, I don't know, publications or, or promotional material that can be easily circulated, I, I'd be happy to, to run that up by Paul. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, we're going to work with communications and get something out uh, in terms of uh, a media release that uh, we've done uh, over the last two years with uh, these changing policies. So that's something we can definitely provide to the chamber and yourself. Nicole? Uh, no, you know what, we have this ongoing joke lately that Joe just keeps hitting the, the nail on the head and, and he did so again, I was just going to add the same thing that that uh, we do have communications through our comms department and we could be more than happy to provide those to the chamber and, and even look to do something jointly that would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, 
Just we're in good shape here. Um, can I please get a mover and a seconder on the following motion? That the planning advisory committee receive this report as information and provide feedback to be considered for the recommendation report to committee of the whole, planning administration and council. Very good. Thank you very much. Great. And uh, we need to vote on that, Mr. Chair. Correct. Did we vote on that? No, we yes, we, we will. Okay. Do we have a vote? Nobody has any comments. And uh, through the chair, if I may, if, if um, there's no other comments, a comment could be. Uh, that the committee is generally supportive of the information included in the report. Yeah. Yes. And, and if we could take uh, the chair, take the vote then. Uh, all those in favor of of that uh, that statement being submitted. Paul, Kirby, Barb, Dennis, Ken, Mark, and Councillor Utley. All opposed. Hey, that's carried. All right, consent items number five. Uh, can I get a mover and seconder for the approval of the minutes from uh, March 18th? Mark, second. Dennis, great, thank you. Resolutions, there are none. Oh, we have to vote on the minutes. On the consent items. Yeah. On the, minutes, the consent <laughs> items. <laughs> on the consent items. <laughs> Can we, can we have a, a vote, please? All those in favor of the minutes? Okay. Dennis, Kirby, Barb, Paul, Ken, Mark, and Councilor Ellie, those opposed? Okay, minutes are carried. Okay. All right, we'll move on to six. Resolutions none. Uh, number seven, uh, no notices of motion. Number eight is. Uh, We've concluded the business of the committee and uh, our Mr. meeting Chair, is adjourned. Mr. Thank Chair, you. could I could I just have one thing? Please? Sure. Uh, it's just an FYI. Um, Bob Bosworth owns a walling company in town, Elite, uh, from Elite to Walling Consumables. And um, Bob and I go back a long time and he, he did some training at uh, Mall College and then he had his own business at the time. And he wants to give back to the community and, and uh, promote the school's trades. So Bob has, has sponsored uh, a Red Sox game on the 29th of July. And he, um, uh, he's going to set up um, some equipment and some booths uh, uh, before, the, uh, before the game from uh, set up from 12 to 6. And then there'll be, um, you know, a, a people coming to the park uh, between six and eight, and they'll be able to see these different trades and equipment. And then uh, the game, there's a, you know, this game starts at, uh, at eight o'clock. So he he um, he's inviting other businesses that may be interested in participating. There's something the city may want to do. I'm not sure, but. Um, it's, um, I say it's at uh, uh, July 20th. I'm going to give the contact information to Melanie. If you could send it out with an email, please, Melanie. Uh, so if you wanted the more information or interested in participating, uh, you, you can contact um, Melanie Johnson, who's the accountant at Elite. And then um, secondly, Mr. Chair, uh, Schools Trades Alliance, uh, is continuing to meet, uh, moving along with uh, some initiatives that the province has instituted, implemented uh, over the past year or two to promote uh, schools trades and get more people, get more trained people out in the, the workforce. So there's a lot of things happening and, and uh, if anyone's interested in, in uh, attending an SDA meeting, uh, I'll be happy to uh, invite you and uh, have you there as a guest so it's uh, interesting i think most of our meetings by zoom these days so it's uh, it's an easy one to log into
Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Councillor, and thanks to all the committee members for uh, doing this. Appreciate it. Have a, have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Well done, Mr. Chair. <laughs>